Okay, we'll make a start. Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Jan Strugnall and I'm the Director for the Centre for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture or the CSTFA and I'd like to welcome you to our seminar series. So the CSTFA is a research provider for sustainable tropical fisheries and aquaculture research globally and we provide world-class multidisciplinary solutions focused research for Australian and research international research resource managers both in government and in the private sector. And for those of you that are joining us from overseas, we're based at James Cook University, which is in Townsville in far North Queensland, Australia. And if you'd like to find out more about us, um, I encourage you to check out our website or please send me an email and I'd be happy to chat. So today it is my really great pleasure to welcome Dr. Evie, Eva Plagani uh, to speak to us. Eva is a senior principal research scientist with CSIRO Oceans and Atmosphere in Brisbane. Her research is strongly interdisciplinary and focuses on the biological modelling of marine resources and ecosystems. Her current projects include Torres Strait, Tropical Rock Lobster and Beach Demur, and she leads the development of MICE, which is models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessments, including applications involving outbreaking crown of thorn starfish impacting Australia's Great Barrier Reef, as well as potential anthropogenic impacts on the northern uh, prawn fishery. She has a dual biological mathematical background, having first worked as a lecturer at the University of Cape Town before taking up a position with CSIRO in 2009. And her research has contributed to the management of marine resources from krill, abalone, forage fish, whales, and even penguins, and uh, has been applied inter alia in Australia, South Africa, and Antarctica. She's an Australian woman in STEM superstar and is on the editorial board of ecological applications and reviews in fish biology and fisheries. And the title of her talk is Models and Methods for Sustaining Tropical Fisheries in a Changing Climate. Um, and we are very pleased that she's joined us again today uh, for her presentation um, and thank her very much for her time. If you have any questions for Eva, I ask you to put that in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you just let me know you have a question and at the end of the presentation, um, I'll uh, give you access to ask um, the question to Eva. Thank you so much, Eva. Thanks so much, Jan, for that introduction. And um, hi to everybody who's joined. Unfortunately, I can't see any names or any faces. So um, just waving hi to to all of you and a special thank you to anyone that's um, dialing in again after the spectacular technology fail last time. So hoping for a smooth run today. Um, so jumping right in, as Jan says, um, I'm based in Brisbane with CSIRO. And what I want to do today is just give you a sort of taste of some of the different fisheries um, up in the tropical north that myself and my colleagues are working on to give you an idea of the kinds of um, models and quantitative methods that we're using to manage those and particularly how we're starting to think about um, accommodating climate change or building resilience to climate change. Um, so because I'm giving a range of examples, I'm going to be drawing on, on work from a number of um, a number of different areas and most of this work actually all of the work is done in teams so I just want to acknowledge up front all my wonderful colleagues and collaborators that I work with and that's going to be our team Torres Strait, team Northern Prawn Fishery as well as team GBR so thanks to my collaborators and just to um, acknowledge again that um, this is all pretty much teamwork and that's largely because a lot of the projects we work on are quite big projects and they require interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary skills. So we often have to put together economists, social scientists, biologists, people with field experience and so forth. So the three um, systems I'm going to tell you a little bit about are first of all, we're gonna start up in the Torres Strait, which is where I do most of my research currently on some of the main fisheries. And then we're going to go west to the Northern Prawn Fishery. So the Northern Prawn Fishery is a multi-species prawn fishery that stretches from the Gulf of Carpentaria right across to the JBG or Joseph Bonaparte Gulf. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's been happening in some of those fisheries and some of our research there. 
And then I'm going to end with a little bit about some of our research on the Great Barrier Reef, which I'm assuming most people on the call are more familiar with. So those of you that have um, been to Torres Strait will know that it's absolutely beautiful part of the world. So good, good place to do one's studies. Um, and the fisheries are very important. They're both socio-culturally as well as economically to the Torres Strait Islanders. It's also one of the few places where there's a treaty that explicitly acknowledges and protects the traditional way of life and livelihood of the traditional inhabitants, including their traditional fishing and free movement. So that means when we're managing fisheries, we can't just focus on the biological aspects. We have to work closely with islanders. We have to account for some of their aspirations and to look at ways in which the research we're doing is compatible with the sociocultural um, aspirations of the islanders. So not only is um, the sort of sociocultural setting quite complicated, but the biology of some of the species is also pretty interesting and complicated. So the, the main fishery there, that's sort of the economic mainstay of the region, is the tropical rock lobster. And this is the same species that you get on the east coast, but it's treated as a, as a separate fishery, even though they are essentially one stock. So as you can see from the diagram, the lobsters in Torres Strait grow really rapidly because they're up in really warm waters. So in their third year of life, that's when the fishery targets them. There's essentially only one age class that's targeted. And towards the end of the fishing season in September to October, the mature um, adults actually walk out of Torres Strait and they can walk up to about even 500 kilometers to the east towards the Gulf of Papua where the spawning occurs. So they're pretty exhausted after that long walk. They might spawn um, multiple times, but there's no return journey of the adults. Instead, the larvae are infected in the coral sea gyre, and eventually the currents will bring those larvae back into Torres Strait to start that three-year life cycle again. There is some mixing with um, the GBR as well, but I'm not, not gonna talk about that today. But I will come back to the role of that coral sea gyre. So this fishery has also got quite a long history. And fortunately, back in 1989, um, my CSRO colleagues were able to start a survey, an annual diving survey. And that's been held continuously, one or two surveys every single year since 1989. So we have a fantastic time series of data that we can fit our models to and to help us understand what's happening to this population. The the population itself is very variable. It bounces up and down, and the catches, therefore, correspondingly, can be doubled or half from one year to the next. And a lot of that is just the natural variability. So looking at the data for that fishery, we have the, what we now call the pre-season survey. We've also had a mid-year survey. So we have a lot of survey, or what we call fishery independent data that we can fit the model to. And then we also have indices from the fishery itself. So this is the CPUE or catch for unit effort from the two sectors, the um, traditional owner fishery sector, as well as what we call the TVH sector, which is the non-islanders. There's also Papua New Guinea also has a one third share in the fishery. So we need to account for that as well. So we fit our models to, to all of the data to provide, fish, to provide management advice. And I've been doing that since um, 2009 and things were bouncing along just great. And then what happened in November 2017, we did a survey and we found really low recruitment, really, really poor recruitment. This meant the following year, 2018, when we were setting the quota for that, we had to set a really low quota. And... Um, this caused a lot of consternation. There was a lot of unhappiness by some stakeholders in particular, and there was a lot of distrust initially about the science, whether the survey that had been running for so many years, was it actually reliable? Because it wasn't consistent with some of the Fisher's own CPUE data, which was suggesting things were fine. And um, we sort of explained that difference on the basis of Fisher's can target hotspots, and that's how they can maintain the CPUE, but overall, we felt quite confident that um, the stock was severely suppressed. As a result of, of all of this and the serious economic consequences at the time, we even ran a second survey that year, 
And that survey actually corroborated the first survey, suggesting that it was a really low recruitment year. So fortunately, from working very closely with stakeholders for so many years, we managed to get buy into the science and everybody agreed to stop fishing and the fishery was closed early that year. But of course we were left with lots of questions about what actually happened. And this is where some of the new climate signals that we started to see came in. So this period, as many of you will recall, the first really big El Nino 2015 to 2016, which affected the Great Barrier Reef pretty badly. But this also had massive effects across the top end of Australia. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that as well. And some of the things that it influenced, apart from the temperature, which influences the growth and survival of lobsters, it also changed some of the local currents and this caused sand waves and changes to the habitat of the lobsters. So we had that complication as well. But the other effect we were really interested in was potential changes on that coral sea gyre that I talked about that's so important for the recruitment. And without going into too much detail, we haven't managed to nail this down exactly, but we're pretty sure it's got something to do with the El Nino years um, changing that whole gyre, changing the whole circulation patterns. And so when we did some modeling around this, sort of the models will release particles. So if you look at the, the diagram where the red concentration is, that's where you release your sort of spawned um, larvae. And in a normal year, you can see the sort of blue circle in a way which takes, advects things, the current will advect the larvae back into Torres Strait. But in an El Nino year, sometimes what we see is that those currents are actually sort of deflected to the east and so you expect the larvae to be advected away from Torres Strait. So we're pretty sure this is part of partly what was going on and what explained this poor recruitment year but unfortunately it's not as simple as we hope because you don't see this in all years so it's still more complicated and we still we're still working on that one but it certainly has raised concerns about the future impacts of El Nino's on radically changing those currents and then what that means for the Torres Strait fishery. We've also, we use a sort of fairly standard stock assessment model, but we've also been looking at what is the impact of these really high anomalous um, sea surface temperatures on the growth and mortality. And what we've managed to do in this fishery is because we have all this historical data, we're able to actually fit what is the relationship between mortality and survival look like. And we could actually estimate two parameters with a lot of confidence. We can do it sort of in a statistical framework that tell us where it is that the lobster starts exceeding its thermal tolerance and therefore when we expect there to be increased mortality. So this is one of the ways we're starting to try to sort of explicitly link these climate effects into our stock assessment models. And just to give you a rough idea of that, we can compare what does a trajectory look like if we assume, you know, temperature has no effect compared to one where we actually explicitly link to the temperatures. And we can see that the sea surface temperature can explain some of the variability that we can't do if we just assume temperature has no impact. So we're still building on this research, but it's, um, it's certainly something we're having to increasingly incorporate in our stock assessment models for a number of different fisheries. This is a bit of a complicated slide, but just to say it's, um, we've also doing the same sort of thing we're doing in a lot of Australian fisheries is that we're moving from just using a stock assessment as the basis for providing advice to using what are called harvest control rules. And in this particular fishery, it's an empirical harvest control rule. So that means it's data driven. So we use the information from the surveys, as well as from the CPU information, directly in a formula, which then gives us what the TAC is. So in November, when our dive team does the annual lobster count and we get the data, we can then very simply plug it into this formula and out comes what's the recommended biological catch for the species. So that sounds a little bit too simple to work, but this kind of method has been shown to actually work incredibly well. And we know that because we, we simulation tested. So this is an example of where we use an approach called management strategy evaluation. And what we do there is we have an operating model which can have 
all your bioeconomic components, you can link in social cultural components, whatever components you want, you can model how climate affects it. And then you can simulation test how well different rules perform. So this is where we can build in a whole lot of uncertainties and we can build in um, uncertainties around climate impacts on the stock. And what we do then is we come up with a rule that is robust across all these uncertainties. So that's the beauty of this management strategy evaluation approach. We can sort of pre-test how well we think things are going to work before we actually apply them. So it's a bit like a car crash test simulator where we first crash some dummies rather than going and risking crashing the actual stock. And just to show you a rough example, so here we try 12 different harvest control rules, different rules we might use to manage the fishery. And we look at the trade-offs between the risk to the fishery, what's the future biomass going to be with that rule, how variable a catch is going to be, what is the actual catch going to be. And you can see some of these jump up and down. So with, with stakeholders, we work through all of these and we say, well, which one do you like? So if you like the high catch one, well, has it got an acceptable risk level? No, it hasn't. Are there any others that might perform better? And that way you narrow it down. And so with, um, with all the traditional owners and stakeholders, we work through a number of these until everybody agreed on a particular rule. And that's the rule that I showed you. And the sort of performance then would be expected to be something like this. We expect compared to the historic trend, the gray um, shaded area shows you what you expect the future spawning biomass to bounce around between and what you expect the future catch to be. So this is a rule that's deliberately trying to dampen some of that variability in the catch. So that's one of the ways that um, we're managing a lot of these fisheries and sort of simulation testing so that we can have robust rules that we have some confidence in. But of course, it's not just climate change that's causing shocks. We've also had shocks from COVID recently. And the Torres Strait fishery certainly was one of the first fisheries to be pretty negatively affected. So on the 26th of January, the last sort of live shipment went to China. So almost all of these lobsters are exported live to China. And um, with the demand plummeting with COVID, this obviously had a major effect on the fishery. It was also the time of peak demand and peak prices. And there were all sorts of flow on effects that many of you would be aware of from other fisheries like surplus live lobsters in, in holding tanks and so forth. So how do we deal with these kind of shocks going forward? And in a previous um, research project, we actually looked at the supply chain. So the supply chain is from when you land your lobster all the way to what are the the sort of storage, the transport, the processes, until it ends up sort of on the plate of a consumer. And we developed a technique which would highlight which are the really vulnerable sort of elements in the supply chain and how could you build resilience around those. And the high, the, what that little figure there shows in the orange and yellow, that was highlighting these sort of key vulnerable elements. And it's turned out that with a COVID shock, we've seen exactly the same thing, that those sort of critical nodes were, were hit most. And we have this for a number of different fisheries. So it's just pretty interesting that an approach we were developing to look at climate shocks is actually so similar to what we might use to look at um, COVID shocks, for example. So moving on with... Um, Torres Strait, as I mentioned to you, it is an area where one needs to work very closely with the tra traditional owners. And so myself and my team spend a lot of time up there. We're very fortunate to go to some, some beautiful islands and um, to participate sort of with hands-on training as well as workshops and discussions with, with locals. And this has been particularly important with the um, sea cucumber or beshta mare fishery, which is the second most important fishery in the region. As many of you will know, sea cucumbers are pretty easy to overexploit because you can just pick them up by hand. They're very valuable. They mostly get um, exported to Asian markets as well, but they also have very important ecosystem role. And so there's a need to carefully manage sea cucumbers. The Great Barrier Reef um, is a good example of, you know, even, even in that area, there's been this sort of 
depletion of some of the really valuable species like the, the black teat fish. And over time, there have been new species with new markets that have developed that have kept this fishery going as well. So we've drawn on our research from the Great Barrier Reef as well as from Torres Strait and tried to sort of compare some of the lessons. But managing one of these fisheries is complicated because you've got this different mix of species with different life histories and some of them, like the black teat fish, has been going down or was closed both on the East Coast and Torres Strait for a few years. Whereas other species like the curry fish, there's new opportunities as they've learned to process them and we need to try to figure out how to manage those. So last year in particular, we were really excited to have a new harvest strategy for the sea cucumber fishery in Torres Strait. Um, endorsed by the PZJA, that's the Protected Zone Joint Authority. And this is sort of meant to be a start to improving the whole management in Torres Strait of this fishery. So some of it is, is quite simple. We've done things like classify species into closed or recovering groups, target species, as well as basket species, where we sort of lump together some of the low value mixed species. And then we've come up with a framework, which we work quite closely with stakeholders to do this, which starts right at what we call a low tier, that first of all says, very importantly, are there data for this fishery? And if they aren't, no, you can't fish it. There's no opening for the fishery. And that sounds really simple, but it was actually really important because previously it wasn't compulsory to record data. And we wanted to set up incentives to start getting reliable data collection and then to show how you could progress and build the fishery over time so as you get more data whether it's from fishery um, independent and um, fishery dependent data like cpue or surveys as you get more data you basically need to be less precautionary and you can potentially grow some of the tacs or the total allowable catches on species where there's evidence that they're being sustainably fished. So this was um, a pretty exciting um, achievement because we got really good buy-in from a lot of the traditional owners. This is a 100% traditional owner um, owned fishery. And we also developed a harvest strategy that allowed the traditional owners to maintain their customary practices and sort of add on to it their own cultural laws for how to manage at the finer scale. So we did the sort of high level, what are some of the rules? And then we allowed flexibility for locals to add their own kind of management rules. And this one's basically designed to create this incentive. So this is the first year that we are applying it. So we're still watching to see how that one works. Of course, sea cucumbers are also very vulnerable to climate change. And in previous work, we've sort of mapped some of the different climate change variables. So I won't go into all the detail, but we've tried to look at how could they affect not only the populations, but also say the fishing behavior and the future markets. And we've tried to wrap that into considerations for the management as well. So we again did a management strategy evaluation study and try to come up with what would be climate smart management strategies. What are, the, excuse me, what are the lessons we could learn from that? And so one of the key lessons was that, you know, with monitoring, you do better, that adaptive feedback performs best, some sort of obvious things there as well. But this has been a useful framework to understand how we make these management strategies climate smart. So that's a bit of what's been going on in Torres Strait. I'm going to move now to the prawn fisheries I mentioned and across to the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf. Um, so earlier this year, we also published something about the El Nino that hit this banana prawn fishery pretty hard. So just to tell you a little bit about what happened in that fishery. So this is the red leg banana prawn and it's, it's sort of one of many species, but it's the main one that's caught in this really remote um, Joseph Bonaparte Gulf. And again, this fishery has been sort of bouncing up and down with variable catches. But if you look at that graph, the bars are the catches. And in 2015, 2016, the catches absolutely plummeted to the lowest they'd ever been. 
And you'll remember from earlier, I mentioned those were El Nino years. And so again, we were left trying to answer what was going on with this fishery. There were too few data even to do a stock assessment. And this was the clue to, to what we thought at the time was going on because one of the industry um, stakeholders said to us that the tides had been really weird that year. And when we looked at the satellite images, we saw that indeed the um, El Nino had completely messed with, with all the currents and tides and things in the area. And if you look at um, the dark purple, what that is, is this is just one of several plots over that um, strong El Nino. And the dark purple is saying that your median sea level is up to 18 centimeters lower. And across that top end from the Gulf of Carpentaria, particularly in the Joseph Van Aparte Gulf, you can see there was this massive lowering of the sea level. And this is also in separate work um, by others. It's been by Duke et al. It's been used to explain why we had these massive mangrove diebacks. But this was what we, we assumed was the key to what was happening with the red leg banana prawn. And this is particularly concerning given that um, Australia is um, predicted to experience much more intense and frequent El Ninos in the next few years. So to show you what's happening, this is the, a plot of the habitat of these red leg banana prawns. So the fishery is offshore in the spawning and fishing grounds, but basically the larvae inhabit the sort of estuarine nursery habitat. So that's where we've indicated in green. And they have to get into that habitat and then they have to move offshore again. The post larvae need to be advected back to the fishing grounds. And in that El Nino year, what we think happened is that there was sort of a breakdown, if you like, of those tidal highways. Um, if you think there was not a lot of rain, so not a lot of water in the fresh water rivers and the whole sea level was depressed. And so that whole sort of recruitment pathway, we think broke down. And we think that's why um, there, was, there was much less spawning. So we've done some analyses and basically, if you look at the red box, the main finding we're predicting is that with the SOI less than minus seven, in other words, in an El Nino year, when the rainfall is less than the median, we predict very low CPUE. And this is important because the fishers have to steam a long way to come and fish in this area. And so we want to be able to warn them when it's going to be bad year. And at the same time, we want to protect the spawning stock. We want to reduce fishing in these particular years. So this is now informing going forward how we should modify some of the management for this fishery. And we've currently just finished a project that's been led by my lovely colleague, Laura Blaney, who's new to CSRO. And we're again using this approach management strategy evaluation to look at the trade-offs between different harvest strategies, which account for the El Nino effect or are more precautionary for when the stock is low and looking at the trade-offs. So industry have yet to um, choose their preferred rule, but um, we can tell you more about this in, in the coming months. So the picture is more complicated because there's also economic sort of interactions between the different fisheries. So this, this diagram shows you season one at the top, season two at the bottom. And for example, in the Gulf of Carpentaria in the first season, they mostly target the common banana prawn, which is different to the red leg banana prawn, which is in the JBG. And then in season two, they mostly target tiger prawns in the Gulf of Carpentaria. So it's a complicated fishery. And on top of that, there's plans for, for dams and water extraction for agriculture up in the north. And so we're trying to understand the impacts of those freshwater removals on the prawn fishery and to quantify that, as well as the impacts on some other key species. So we've currently got a, a project, an FRDC project, where we're focusing on a few key species in what we call a mice model. And we're going to be testing different, different kinds of impacts to try to find ways to mitigate against extraction of fresh water for this fishery. So the model we're using there is my favorite kind of model called MICE. So MICE are models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessments. So basically these models try to find the sweet spot where you reduce your model uncertainty um, 
and you find this intermediate level of complexity. So in other words, we don't include hundreds of species, we just include some key species for focused questions so that we can more rigorously provide advice around that. Um, so if you were doing a big ecosystem model like an Atlantis or an Ecosim, that gives you a very broad look, strategic look at what's happening to a system. But if you actually want to provide more targeted, rigorous advice to support management, then using a model of intermediate complexity is going to mean your results are a little bit more reliable at the expense of having you know, fewer species included. So that's the approach we're using there as well as in a number of other fisheries. So MICE models are increasingly being applied um, globally in a number of places in Europe and the US as well. And we've applied them in Antarctica as well, where we modeled with um, Liv Tulach. We recently modeled interactions between the large baleen whales and the krill, for example. In Australia, we're using them on the prawns, but the, the sort of example I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about is the one on the Great Barrier Reef. So this is essentially our mice model of cuts and corals. So we have a model with different um, stages or ages of the crown of thorn starfish or cuts, which is a voracious sort of coral eating pest really. Um, that, is, that is the third biggest um, cause of decline in corals on the Great Barrier Reef after bleaching and cyclones. But it's the only one we can actually realistically do something about. So we do want to try to manage these cuts as much as we can to give the corals a bit of a chance to recover from bleaching and other impacts. But it's not that simple. We have limited resources to do it. There's lots of different tools we could use. So we're using models to help us understand, for example, some of those other, um, the fish, the small predators, understanding the role of marine protected areas. There's different people working on all of these components, trying to understand how we can complement ways to manage the cuts. But we also wanted to directly help with what's the relationship between the cuts and the coral, and how should we best deploy resources on the reef so that we have the maximum sort of impact on the cuts. We can kill as many as possible, so that the coral has the best possible chance. So we've been using as a, a sort of base, a model we built a few years back, which was fitted to long-term monitoring data from AIMS. Um, so for example, you can see we fitted to data on the number of cuts, the time series, as well as different, um, two different categories of coral. And this gave us um, a good sort of parameterization for the impact of cuts on corals and then how long it takes those corals to recover. One of the ways we've also applied this model is to try and figure out what we call ecological thresholds. So we want to know when are cuts and coral exactly in balance. So by that I mean if your coral growth is less than the amount that's being grazed, your coral is going to decline. On the other hand, if your cut's grazing is less than the growth of your coral, then your coral has a chance to recover. And where the two are completely in balance is where at least you're holding, you're holding the position you're at. And so we could use these models to work out what is that point where the coral and the cuts balance because it, it differs depending on the densities of, of um, cuts as well as how good the coral cover is. And that's an ecological threshold that we've then used to help figure out what level the cuts should be culled to before divers move on to different reefs, for example. And this is an example of what, what that looks like. So what we've got on the um, horizontal axis here is the fast growing coral cover depletion level. So how much coral is there? So if you focus around, say, 35% coral cover, that's the red dot there, then we work out from our models, what is the cuts density that keeps that exactly in equilibrium? And we find that point actually matches quite well with field studies, for example, by Keesing and Lucas. So this tells us for different coral levels, what is the cuts density that keeps it in equilibrium? 
And what we need to do now is we need to relate that to the, the sort of cots killed per minute that the divers in the field are experiencing so that we can use that to tell them when to move on to the next reef. So how to sort of optimally cull these cots. So that gets quite complicated. Those of you that dive will know that um, it can be quite complicated trying to calibrate, cross calibrate between things like manta toes, what a scuba diver sees, particularly with cots, you're gonna miss a lot of the small animals. It doesn't matter how good you are, they, they're almost impossible to find. So we need to figure out what sizes are divers seeing? What do we think is really there? What are the real numbers? What would you see in a manta toe? How do all of these numbers tie up together? So we've used our models and available data to try to come up with some of these cross calibrations. And we can then use it to convert that earlier figure I showed you to units of catch per unit effort. So these are the ecological thresholds that are actually used in the COTS control program and the Gabrimpa coordinates. So for example, for low coral cover, we have a different um, rate of cuts per minute to the equilibrium value when coral cover is higher. And so this guides some of the um, operations in the field. Of course, this is a little bit um, more complicated as well. And um, PhD student Jacob Rogers has been working on a much finer reef scale model to try to further improve some of this management advice. So watch the space for, for some of that as well. So I've gone through quite a bit there, but basically what I was trying to show you was that there's a range of methods that we use from very simple to um, pretty complex sort of models, management strategy evaluation, sometimes just plotting the empirical data as well as across a range of scales from the local scale to the regional. So for example, that Cots Coral Mice model has been embedded in a regional model, um, which Scott Condy has been leading and has shown that you can actually replicate some of the um, cycles that one does see in Cots populations. So we're using models, we can't use one model for everything. We're using models at a range of different scales to help address management questions. And importantly, in um, most of this work we're doing, we're increasingly finding that um, climate change is such a big signal that we're needing to think of ways to incorporate it into the more traditional methods that we've used in the past. So when we do that, what we try to do is sort of road test what are our optimal management decisions. So we can test how robust we think they'll be to climate change before we actually apply them. So that's all for me for today. So thanks, thanks very much for your time. <laughs> thanks, Jan. I'm going to hand back to you now. Thanks so much, Eva. We have a few questions already. So Lynn uh, Shannon, I'll just, um, uh, if you, I'll unmute you so you can ask your question if you like. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, hi, Eva. Hi, hi, Lynn. hi. thanks for the wonderful seminar. Um, thanks for listening. It's lovely to know people from oh, online. Yeah, there's a whole lot of us online. Oh, <laughs> well, that's but, divine. <laughs> um, Eva, I, I, might, I may have missed it, but is, is the reason that the cots have become such a um, threat to the coral and, you know, the third most, um, the third largest threat, is that because of climate change or is it because the structure of the food herb has changed and, and you have different, you know, there's been a, a trophic cascade or something? Um, I was just interested in, in what, um, what you have, you know, what the reasons for that are and if you've been modeling that and looking at the data. Oh, thanks, Lynn. You've, you've sort of um, gone straight to the key question, which unfortunately after 20 years, we probably don't have an answer for you. We certainly think that climate change is part of it, but you know, so the cots are a, a natural occurring species and we have had these outbreaks in the past. Um, we, we aren't sure whether the cots themselves are benefiting a little bit from, from warmer water, for example. There's, 
a lot of um, research suggesting that maybe they're benefiting more from the enhanced nutrients. So it's not as simple as climate change in the, the case of the cuts. It's probably more that the enhanced nutrients, for example, after the big floods, um, there was a lot of runoff and there's some speculation that that could have enhanced the survival of the larvae, but it, it's, it's quite a complicated picture. So some of the anthropogenic impacts are definitely making the cuts outbreaks worse. But the problem with the coral is that because the climate change is mainly knocking the coral so badly and there's much more extensive bleaching than ever before and it's, you know, it's really, really bad. Um, so that makes the coral much more vulnerable. And so we just think that adding cuts on top of that can almost just be too much and tip it, tip it over. So the idea of the big cuts control program is to sort of help the coral while buying us some time really, while we hope there's some more global action on climate change. I hope that um, answers, oh, just sorry, your question about the predator structure of the food web. Absolutely, we think that's a big role as well. So one of the natural predators, the tritons, was fished out uh, as well. Um, and so we're unsure exactly to what extent the tritons played a role in controlling the cuts, but they certainly did play some role. And there's some evidence from some of the green zones, so the protected areas where there's um, a more intact sort of predator structure, as, as you put it, um, that that is, that is sort of helping suppress the cuts. But again, it's, um, we don't have clear answers and there's a big team of people working to try to better understand all of these effects. Um, Great, thanks for that. It's so interesting. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty hard to figure out what's going on when you've got climate on top of other anthropogenic signals and fishing and, and um, everything sort of happening at once. Eva, I just have a question as well about your tropical lobsters. And yeah. before the start, I was talk we were talking a little bit about the aquaculture too. So I know they use purulus collectors a lot for aquaculture, especially over in Vietnam. And so I was wondering why, they, um, especially given in the southern rock lobster fisheries and eastern rock lobsters, they use those also, my understanding is for as a fisheries management tool and to understand more about recruitment, that that isn't a tool that's used at all in the in the tropical rock lobsters, if I understood? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jan. That's that's a good question. Um, firstly, the, so the tropical lobsters are, are a bit different to, for example, the southern ones or people in South Africa, the Jaces lelandii, which is a colder water, slowing, slower growing one. So, you know, a lobster that's huge after three years is is quite different for one. Um, but also the tropical lobsters don't, they won't go into cages, so we don't catch them in the same way, for example, the southern lobster here is caught in the cages. And they haven't had that much success, even with the um, purulus collectors. So with those purulus collectors, if you were monitoring recruitment that way, you essentially, you're getting a, so say your tropical lobster is caught after three years, you're getting a sort of heads up for what it might be in three years. And that's not really good enough with such a highly variable fishery like the tropical lobster. We needed a much more direct measurement of what recruitment's going to be. So because, because there are just so many factors, there's that big you know, recruitment cycle, we, we do the survey in November right before the season. So it's called a pre-season survey so that we have quite a direct index of what that recruitment is. And then because it's only really a single cohort, one year that's caught, that tells us more precisely you can catch 400 tons or 800 tons. So it's a little bit different to the slower growing ones where you might catch a few different age classes, for example. But great question. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are, there, there, are there any other questions for Eva? You see, you, can you see the Q&A there? Eva? I can see yep. one on, did you overlay the cuts management with the other two drivers of coral decline? How much does management of cuts help in view of these? Thanks, that's again a little bit um, 
similar to Lynn's question, but the answer is yes. So um, I have not done all that myself, but working with other modelers, particularly Jacob Rogers, as I mentioned, who's doing his PhD on this, as well as Scott Condy's model, we have tried to overlay all of these different impacts. And definitely in some of the work, climate change is such a dominant signal, which is why we're sort of saying, look, all we're doing is buying ourselves time, because if we don't sort out the bleaching, doesn't matter if we get rid of all the cuts, there won't be any coral there. So we can see it, it makes a big difference. Um, and we are trying to separate what the impacts are, but we definitely, we've recently published some research with Russ Babcock, Dave Westcott, um, Cameron Fletcher and others, where we show that the COTS management does actually have a discernible signal. It does make a difference and it does help the corals to potentially recover, but how long we can sustain that, um, that's gonna depend on what the sort of emissions look like in the near future. Thank you. Are there any final questions for Eva? Okay, we, we might leave it there. I just want to sincerely thank you for such a wonderful presentation, great diversity of species and really fascinating models. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the work that you do. So thank you so much. And thanks for being patient with us to, to give a repeat <laughs> seminar. We are really grateful. Oh, well, thanks so much for the invite, Jan, and, and thanks to everyone who's joined today. And I'm sorry if I went a little bit quickly through it, but I did want to just give you a taste of sort of how we're using some of the models and um, hopefully just get hold of me if you have any questions or, or want to chat about um, suggestions you have for our research as well. So thanks again so much. <laughs>